All over the Germantown Metro Park tonight, nets are going up. Welcome to the 2022 Ohio Bat Blitz. You're joining us at a remote bat monitoring station in Germantown Metro Park with exclusive access to a bat mist nagging site. And we're here with Marlo Perdikas, a uh, park biologist. So, what is a bat blitz and why are we doing it here in Southwest Ohio? Um, this is the first year we've ever done the Ohio Bat Blitz. It was a joint effort among different conservation groups throughout the state, um, and also including Bat Conservation International. Nice. And um, we're doing the Bat Blitz to survey bats across um, their range in the state of Ohio. Um, we're here at Germantown um, uh, Metro Parks. And we're doing it here in southwestern Ohio because it's an under-surveyed area in the state. Okay. Um, surveys are conducted um, to study bats around uh, the country. And in particular in Ohio, we have a couple of bats that are federally listed species. Oh, wow. And so um, there are park districts like Summit Metro Parks, where I work, where we survey for bats to better understand what bats we have um, okay. in what parks. Bat surveys are conducted for various reasons, right. um, but in general, Southwestern Ohio is an under-surveyed area, so we decided to do our inaugural um, Ohio Bat Blitz down here. Nice, lucky us. Yeah. Can you explain bat mist netting and how it works? So this is a mist net. It's very difficult to see in the dark. Um, it's made of nylon mesh. And the mesh has um, these tremor lines. There's five tremor lines in a net. And the net at the tremor line has a bag in it. Oh, wow. um, we use this mist net system uh, near waterways, along trails, along right-of-way corridors. Um, we set them up using a pole and pulley system. Uh, we can stack the nets on top of each other to create the width and the height that we need. Uh, when we use a mist net, we try to close the corridor off so that we're kind of tricking the bats to fly into the net and get um, essentially tangled inside the net. Biologists that's permitted to handle bats can come and untangle the bat out of the net. And once they do that, then we can collect some biological data. Um, we do mist netting um, for a variety of reasons. Uh, we talked about the fact that we have some bats that are federally endangered species. And so it's important for us to know what bat species we have in our natural areas. Um, mist netting is a typical way to study bats in the summertime. Once we have those bats in hand, we can collect biological data. Um, we take some measurements, determine uh, their gender, what species of bat they are, um, but then we can also do some additional studies, so do um, some analyses on their guano. Um, we can apply transponders to the bats and then track their movements using radio telemetry. The mist net is kind of the first step in studying the bat. Once we have the bat in hand, we can do some additional things. Interesting. We try to catch them in typical corridors where they fly, so perhaps down a stream corridor, or a trail in a park, or even a right-of-way corridor. While we're waiting, what is a bat? A bat is a mammal. Um, it's the only mammal we have that's capable of true flight, which is a beautiful thing. Oh yeah. Um, I always wished I could fly, so I would love to be a <laughs> bat. It's one of the reasons why I fell in love with them. Oh. Um, they give birth to live young. Um, they nurse their pups when they're born, um, and their pups drink milk. They're covered in fur. They're nighttime creatures. There are bats that pollinate too, aren't there? There are. So in warmer parts of our country and in other parts of the world, uh, we have bats that are pollinators, so they drink nectar, and in turn, as they visit flowers, um, they uh, pollinate plants. So um, if we enjoy things like 
bananas. And so bats are a pretty diverse group of animals throughout our world. Um, but if you live in Ohio, um, all the bats here eat bugs. And so in spring, summer, and fall, we have our bats here and they're active and flying at nighttime and eating insects. And then in the winter months, the bats either need to fly south for the winter um, and remain in a warm climate where there are bugs, or they need to sleep during the winter because their food resources are scarce. And with them eating so many insects, they're pretty good pest control? They can eat 25% uh, or more of their body weight wow. in bugs. We have some bat species that eat a lot of the pests that affect our crops. So Helpful. Um, yes. <laughs> so in particular, a very common bat that we have here in Ohio is called the big brown bat. Oh, all right. It is big. And it's one of the larger bats that we have in our state. And because they're a little bit bigger of a bat, they can eat larger prey items. Oh. And they eat a lot of the beetles. So they eat things that prey on our uh, crops, like corn and soybeans. So nice. um, that's a really great reason to love bats. Yeah, yeah. Pretty helpful. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Wow, so, so you got a bat. Can you walk us through what you're doing? Yeah, so we are going to um, take some biological measurements on our bat. And the first thing I always do is weigh the bat. We need a bigger scale because we're looking at big browns here and there are a couple larger species that we have. So you guys can help me do math. We're at 32 grams. Just wait a second. That includes the bag bag. And I'll put it over here. Thank you. Yes. At least she's being cooperative and giving us one or something. at a, a bat, we want to know um, what species the bat is, we want to know if it's a male or female, what its current reproductive status is, um, so if the bat is an adult, is she post-lactating? So that's what we'd be looking for at this time of the year. Um, in the spring or summer, we could tell whether she was nursing a pup. We can look here a little bit at the bat wing. Their wing is like a modified arm. So this back here uh, is their elbow. This is their forearm. This knot up here is their uh, hand or their wrist. This little structure right there is their thumb. And they have four um, fingers and a thumb just like we do. So one, two, three, and four. And when we look at the joints of this particular bat, we can see that they're long and flattened. And that demonstrates to me that this is a baby that was born earlier this spring. So, how did you get interested in bats? Um, well, I was working on my degree in ecology oh. um, as a college student. And I was interested in doing work with wildlife. And so I found a local project. Um, oh. There was a local research project going on where they were studying bats in the Cobb oh, wow. Valley National Park, um, which is close to where I live. Okay. And I signed on as a volunteer okay. and helped the first night and saw bats up close and I was hooked. Oh, neat. Yeah. Neat. Well, what advice have you got for people that want to work with bats now? Um, most of the people that uh, work with bats have some type of degree in biology or ecology and um, they just need to find a mentor, somebody who's oh. already doing some work with bats mm -hmm. and try to volunteer and get experience. What kind of threats do they face? What about people letting their cats out? Is that a problem? Cats can be a problem okay. for bats as well, okay. sure. Um, they can even find bats that are mistakenly on the ground for some reason. Okay. 
um, you know, cats can also be at water sources where oh. bats are trying to get a drink. Mm -hmm. um, cats are good at climbing trees, yeah. uh, which is where bats are typically hanging out during the day oh. uh, when they're not flying. Right, right. Um, bats also have some threats like um, degradation of habitat. As we take habitat away, yeah. the bats have less places to find food, um, raise their young, things like that. Right. Um, a more recent threat is white-nose syndrome. Mm. Uh, white-nose syndrome is a fungus that was brought here from Europe. Um, it exists in cave habitats, and uh -huh. caves are where um, a large portion of our bats spend their winter. Oh, so yeah. in the wintertime, bats, uh, many bats try to hibernate for about six months out of the year. Oh, wow. When they come in contact with um, the fungus that causes white-nose syndrome, um, it gives them an infection. Mm -hmm. And um, during hibernation, bats have their immune systems slowed down, their metabolism slowed down so that they can exist for six months. They're trying to sleep out winter right. and the lack of food resources that winter mm -hmm. um, creates. Yeah. And so because the bats get sick from white nose syndrome, they wake up and try to increase their metabolism and their immune oh. system and they run out of their fat reserves. Oh, geez. So now they have an infection, they get secondary infections, yeah. they don't have food or water to drink, okay. and they become very ill and often will starve to death. Okay. And is that something that's spreading around the country? It is. It started in the northeastern part of the United States where it was introduced, and it's um, moving across the United States to the west. Are scientists working on that? They are. Um, it, it's been around since about 2006, okay. and so we've had a good amount of time for scientists to understand what it even was. Right. They're also working on ways to understand, are these bats um, producing immunity to it? Uh, originally, when it came into the United States, mm -hmm. um, in caves where it was found, it was killing 98 to 100%. Oh my gosh. Of the bat populations that were hibernating in those caves. Wow. Um, so it's a very serious disease. Yeah. Um, we're seeing that there are some bats that are immune to um, or resistant to the fungus. Okay. Um, and so that's helping the bat populations. Um, there are some bat species that are hibernating farther south than Ohio, and so their hibernation period is shorter. Oh. Um, that's allowing the bats to get in and out of hibernation okay. before they succumb to white-nose syndrome. Right. Um, there are some things that are helping and working, but we're facing the fact that many of our bat populations have decreased 80, 90, almost 100%. Wow. And so it's going to take a very long time for our bat species to recover. That are just at home. Is there something they can do to help bats? Sure. Um, it's really important for people who like and appreciate bats to tell other people about them. Oh, yeah. Um, I've been doing bat mist netting demonstrations for 20 years. Oh, and geez. every time we have the public come out and visit, and see bats up close. It gets people excited about bats. It makes them understand why they're important, that yeah. they're not as scary as all the <laughs> myths really. that are out there. Um, things yeah. like they're not going to really get caught in your hair. Yeah. Um, bats in Ohio don't suck your blood. Um, all those types of things. And so if you learn about bats and tell other people about bats, they can care about bats too. Um, there's other bat organizations that you can follow and even contribute to, like Bat Conservation International. Um, there's bat houses that can be built and put up to try to encourage bats to come and live um, on your property. Um, just doing some important things at home, like planting native species in your yard. Um, native plants attract native insects. Okay. And as we've been talking, bats eat bugs so yeah, the more yeah. bugs we can create in our yard the better chance bats have so avoiding pesticides and chemicals yes okay. and planting native plants also um, it's important to leave uh, dead parts of your trees if it's possible um, bats in the summertime our females use um, either cracks or crevices in trees or bark that's exfoliating from trees. Okay. Oftentimes that's a dead limb or even a snag. 
Um, if that dead limb or snag is not a threat to infrastructure on your property, if it can be left standing, um, that will attract bats to your property naturally. Okay. Well, Marla, thanks for giving us a behind the scenes look at your research. You're very welcome. And it's been a pleasure. Oh, great. And thank you guys for joining us. We'll uh, see you next year, the next Ohio Bat Blitz.